Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you glad to be here? Say amen. Amen. We have Delia this morning that has come, and she's made a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And boy, I'm so excited. I met this young lady several years ago, and little did I know God would bring her here, and we'd have this moment with her. And so uh, she has professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is our day of confession of that faith through baptism. And so we're excited about that. And and, uh, we have several candidates for baptism today, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Deal you in the obedience to the command of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I baptize you this day, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the precious Holy Spirit of God. Buried with the Lord Jesus in baptism, risen with Jesus in a newness of life. This young man is <laughs> Shannon. He has pro- made a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as well. And uh, I too have met him years ago. And again, same blessing just to be able to baptize him today is just an honor, just a joy. And and uh, look, you got to remember all these guys and girls get nervous, and uh, it's okay though. It's okay. Everybody said, "Amen." Amen. amen. And uh, hey, will you pray for Shannon in his new walk for Christ? Let him hear you say, "Amen." Amen. 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 And Shannon, in obedience to the command of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, I baptize you now, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit of God. Bear with the Lord Jesus in baptism. Risen with Jesus in a newness of life. God bless you. Amen. Both, both of those first two work for uh, the police officer office and that police officer. So, amen. Isn't that wonderful? We praise the Lord for that. Amen. I'm going to talk to you about this young lady right here. This is my family. This is my aunt, Aunt Sue. And uh, this is her husband and daughter over here. Uh, and they are here to support her. And listen, she has made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And uh, boy, I tell you what, it's no greater joy than to have this right here today. And I'm so grateful. You're going to have to hear her testimony one day. Uh, the Lord has something to say through her. I really believe that. Amen. And so she's come in obedience today. Uh, to doing what the Lord has called her to do. And I give God the praise for that. Amen. 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 And ain't Sue, in obedience to the command of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit of God. Bear with the Lord Jesus in baptism. Risen with Jesus in a newness of life. Amen. God bless you. If you was here last Sunday, you saw Aubrey come. And uh, made a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know his parents are here and his folks are here. And they're just uh, full of joy for what God has done in Aubrey's life. And Aubrey, we love you. Amen. In obedience to the command of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, I baptize you now, my sister, 
in, by brother in the name. <laughs> I'll never live that one down. My brother in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit of God. Bear with Jesus in baptism. Risen with Jesus in another side. Okay? I love you, man. God bless you. Amen. I'm still on the sisters. Amen. Hey, I can do this all day. Amen. All right, come on. This young man is named Jaden, and he and I was able to meet this week, and we talked, and he made a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. His folks over here, his mama's crying tears of joy because because he he waited till today to she know she know when he when he walked up in this baptistry. And, uh, so we praise the Lord for his parents rejoicing with them today as they pray for their son, and Jaden's come uh, professing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ this day. And Jaden, in obedience to the command of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the precious Holy Spirit of God. Buried with the Lord Jesus in baptism, risen with Jesus in the newness of life. Yeah. All right, it is done as the Lord has commanded, Casey. Hey, let's give Jesus praise, amen. Amen. Welcome to Pine Ridge, everyone. Glad to see everybody here this morning. Isn't it wonderful to see the profession of faith in water baptism? That's wonderful. Everybody having a new birthday right there, risen in Christ. We have a few announcements this morning. Uh, first of all, well, I'll wait till that on last. Uh, the fundraiser for Titus Hall, there is a sheet on the back table there uh, for the sign up for the fundraiser in honor of or in memory of. And it'll be for our brick pavers to go across between the two uh, buildings there. Also, um, campers, see Brother Lynn, or we'll see brother, today we'll see Brother Lynn. Brother Lynn, if you would stand up, everybody can see you. Wave it, wave it, every, Brother Lynn, let's see him. Uh, for the, that's for the campers, for the Titus Hall uh, guys that are coming the last week of June. It's a guys and gals, couples, uh, they'll be coming. We're going to need some campers to house those folks while they're here working on Titus Hall. So if you, need to, if you have a camper and you'd like to donate just for that week or that little short time, uh, see Brother Lynn about that. Also, we have VBS coming. There's uh, signs that are in the back in the foyer. If you'd like a sign to put in your yard, grab one on the way out. There's not very many of them, but a few. If you'd like one, grab one on the way out. But uh, Brother Casey's going to mention a few words about that. Okay, so uh, VBS coming up June 5th through the 9th. And uh, so we've got registration open. Uh, it's on the Church Center app and online. How many, uh, just show of hands, how many of you here are using the Church Center app, our Pine, our app? So we've got a good, good bit of people that aren't. If you aren't using the Church Center app, just go to your app store, whether you got an iPhone or you got an Android. Just type in Church Center, download it. It'll ask you to select your church, select Pine Ridge Baptist Church, and uh, go in there, and you'll be able to register for, uh, for VBS. We need teachers, volunteers, whoever's going to be here that week so we can get you shirts. Go in there and do that, and then register your students as well. The, uh, for the classes, it is for the grade that they just completed, if, you, if you're already using Church Center and you select your child and it does not have the right grade right there, just select the closest one. There will be a question that says grade most recently completed. Select that. We'll manually move them into the class uh, if needed. If, um, so if you can, do this as, as timely as possible so we can make sure that we can get shirts ordered prior to VBS. Uh, we will probably have another round like we usually do, but uh, to make sure we can get your kids and the teachers and everybody's shirts uh, beforehand, please go ahead and go in there and get that done. All right, and also, again, welcome to the visitors. We have coffee in the back, restrooms also back there, a nursery on this side. If you're visiting with us for the first time today, we're so glad to have you. Welcome to Pine Ridge. We're going to open this morning in a word of prayer before uh, Brother Jason and before Casey sings. 
Uh, Father, we come to you in prayer, Lord, thanking you for your many, many blessings. Lord, the, the baptisms this morning, Lord, the, some more folks have, have off, uh, come into your, your kingdom, Lord. The, your, their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Lord, we're so happy to hear that. But, Lord, I thank you, thank you for your, the, the, the rain that we're able to have this morning. It's so dry, Lord. I thank you for that. Lord, we're for your blessings, your mercy that you show us. Lord, I thank you for saving my soul, that blood that was stained across just for me. Lord, I thank you for that as well. Lord, for Brother Jason this morning, I pray that you'll speak through him. Lord, open our hearts and our minds that we can hear from you, Lord, through him. Lord, I give him the strength and all these things we ask in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we begin worship. I'm so thankful to see what's going on in these kids' lives and these people's lives back here. How many of you are thankful for Calvary today? Amen. Here's our spin in vanity and pride Caring not my Lord was crucified Knowing not it was for me he died On Calvary By God's word at last my sin I learned Then I trembled at the law Guilty soul imploring turn to Calvary. There your mercy and your grace was free. There your pardon multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty. everything now I gladly know him as my king now my rapture soul can only sing a Calvary and your mercy and your grace was free there your pardon multiplied down to man Oh the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary Yeah Yeah And your mercy and your grace was free Then your pardon multiplied to me Then my burden so found liberty So 
Man, I don't know about you, but I read that last line. There, my burdened soul. How many of you remember when you had a burdened soul? Amen. Amen. And when you met Jesus at Calvary, he provided that liberty. Amen. Amen. There'll never be another day like it in my life. I don't know about you. Let's praise the Lord this morning. We, uh, we're going to sing this song we, uh, we introduced to you last week. It says, there's honey in the rock. Honey in the rock, water in the stone, men on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need you got. There's honey in the rock.
Amen. How many of you tasted that sweet honey from the rock from the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. No matter what we're going through, we can probably go around this room and spend all day in testimony after testimony of God providing in our lives when we didn't think there was any other way. I'm so thankful that he did. And when I do, it just makes me want to praise him. This is another uh, new song uh, for this week. And uh, it just simply talks about us praising the Lord. 10,000 hallelujahs. And it talks about when we get to heaven, how that song will reign. We will sing forever and evermore. Let's praise him today. Oh! 
What a day that's going to be, amen, when we get to praise him for all of eternity, amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for loving us, God. We thank you, Lord, that for always providing everything that we need, Father. And Lord, most of all, we thank you today, Lord, for dying on the cross, Lord, providing grace and mercy and the salvation that we need, Father. And we thank you so much for that. And one day, we will get to offer and get to try, as that song says, for all of eternity to repay you in praise for all that you've done for us, Lord. And Lord, I just got it in my mind, in my life, I believe that eternity just isn't long enough to give you all the praise you deserve. God, we just thank you for being here with us. We thank you for your spirit. Lord, I just ask you, Lord, to touch Jason as he comes and Lord, preaches your word, Father. And Lord, I pray that, uh, that hearts will be open to receive, Lord, what you have for us today. I pray your blessing on the offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Children's Church will be going out at this time with Miss Teresa and the gang. And uh, appreciate all of our little kids. Praise God for them. Amen. And uh, good to see y'all here this morning. Uh, our guests that are with us today for the first time, we welcome you. We have been blessed by our Lord with people that come for the first time every week. Literally every week. And we're, we're, we're blessed by that. Uh, so we thank God for for that and all of our little children I think the rain may have slacked up where they can dart across there uh, won't be long we'll have we'll have a new building over here where all our kids will be able to go from here and to there and uh, and that's going to be a blessing now, I want to say this while you turn to Acts chapter 4 um, uh, I so appreciate those that are uh, have been faithful and working on all the projects the building over here and yesterday we had a, a lot of maintenance to do on the other side of the street there and on that building, and uh, that God's blessed us with a lot of facilities, but need more and more, and praise the Lord, uh, we want to always be in that type need of needing more room, amen, uh, just keep growing, just keep expanding, so you pray for us as we grow together, and uh, we know that, that God builds his church, he promised he would, and uh, so I, I just want to say that, that I appreciate it, we want to pray for those who are traveling, uh, several of our brothers and sisters in Christ are School let out, and they took off, and so they were running, and uh, we, we praise God for them. Go have some fun, amen? 
Amen. We need to have some fun. Amen. Yeah. And the rest of you are suffering from terminal seriousness. Yeah. And uh, you need to have some fun. Uh, <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir. I need to have some fun. Uh, Acts chapter 4, and uh, look in verse 23 this morning. Uh, and uh, we had a good early service, uh, and uh, the Word of God is powerful and sharp, and and I uh, heard some good testimony after the service. Some of our, our people that have uh, had good testimony of what we're preaching here today, and it's just good. Well, we last Sunday we kind of, you know, we went from... Um, from uh, Gethsemane to the cross to the grave to the resurrection and then to Pentecost is where we're at now. And we're, we're, we're just preaching like last week we preached on this subject of the need for the church. And there is a need for the church. Um, may I say this, whether the world recognizes or not is irrelevant, but uh, the world needs the church now more than ever. Uh, the world needs to see what you saw this morning more than ever. Um, you know, five baptisms, that was a, that's a blessing, but I'd love to see 500 uh, in one service. We'd just sit here and just baptize till I look like a wrinkled prune, amen? Um, wouldn't that be good, amen? I, I think that ought to be our goals. We ought to set it nothing less than that, uh, that we ought, to, we ought to see souls saved, and especially in these days that we're living in. Of course, we know only God does the saving, and He does, and He has a way to bring people to where He wants them and bring people to the place where He wants them, and so... Um, so uh, we, we praise the Lord for that. But, you know, my, my aunt this morning that was here, she's 85, 85. We baptized her. I just want to mention, you know, that is a miracle. You want to see a miracle? That was a miracle. Amen. Uh, after about 18, to be saved is a miracle. Uh, be saved at all is a miracle. Amen. Anybody with me say amen? I mean, just to be saved is a mir- miraculous thing. The old becomes new. The, uh, you know, uh, the Lord does the transformation. That's just all a miracle. But... Statistically, uh, after you turn about 18 to 19 years old and to be saved after those years, uh, the numbers are mind boggling of how many people don't. So uh, so that's a miracle. I'm just grateful for it and uh, and just a joy in my heart this morning. Um, God's picture of a great church. That's what we're going to look at today. And, you know, uh, we're living in a day where the world does need the church. But what is the church and what is a picture of a good church? I have people all the time say, well, we live over in such and such. And I can tell you all the states, but I'm not that are watching us this morning. And they say, well, you know, we're looking for a church, but we just can't find one. Every time we go, they some kind of crazy off the wall stuff or this or that. Or, so we just watch online, which it's not the same as where you can find a local church. We encourage that uh, and watch us still, but find a local church to get plugged into. But but the question for many people's minds today is, what is the real church today? I mean, you got all kinds of denominations uh, everywhere. You, you know, all kinds of religions. And you got places that cover city blocks and big buildings and lights and cameras and actions. And, and then you got, uh, got people line a stage and they sing with praise groups. Some take and do 100, 200, 300 member choirs. Becky and I have seen before. Um, we've, uh, we see churches that they sing fast songs, upbeat songs. Some just nothing but the hymns and traditional. And that's fine too. Uh, but, but what is it that constitutes a great church? And, and, well, I hope we'll answer that this morning. How does God measure it out? What, what does it look like? Well, I tell people that only God knows who the great churches are. Uh, don't be fooled by what you see. Uh, the Bible even warns us, don't walk by that which we see. Walk by that which we don't see. Walk by faith and not by sight. And so I'm going to give you eight things this morning, and I'm going to try to be as, uh, as concise as possible, but I want you to follow with me, take notes, you're not going to disturb me at all, but uh, I can't see you with these lights anyway, so anyway, um, so I want you to follow with me in Acts chapter 4, and uh, we're going to read verse number 23 and, and following, and we're going to look at a picture of our portrait of a great church, and it's the beginning of the early church, they were first called Christians in this place called Antioch, God's building his church, he said he would, and, and God is, I, I, I just believe this, that God is still building his church. Um, and I believe that when he's finished building his church, his bride, uh, then he's going to come and get us out of this world of sin and debauchery. So he's still working. But one day, the day of Gentiles is going to be over. And uh, the Bible tells us that, that the one last soul is going to be saved. It may be this service. And then, bam, we're going to be gone. I believe that. I believe we'll be out of here. Uh, nobody knows that time or hour. But, but in doing so, I want to be a great church. I, I don't want to be smoking mirrors. I don't want to just be a big crowd. I don't want to just be... 
a church with a lot of number of people. I want to be a great church. And so I began to take my Bible and say, okay, what is a great church? What does it look like? Well, you look at the early church and you begin to see. Look in verse 23. And uh, the Bible says, and being let go, I'm just going to cut right into the middle of this chapter. Uh, the Bible says, and being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders said to them. And when they had heard, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God. Can I get a witness? Amen. And uh, he is God. He said, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them or in them is. If you're reading King James, who by the mouth of thy servant, David, has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Let me just say this. Those kings of the earth and rulers of the world are still alive today. Maybe not those very ones, but there are still kings and there's even presidents and there's people in high authority that are still against the Lord and his Christ today. And don't be so fooled to think that people in high office isn't against the Lord. I believe that that's where uh, the devil's chief people can be at. So we've got to be real careful today. There's much to say about that. But watch what he says uh, down in verse uh, 27. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever your hand and your counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak the word, your word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, and I like this verse, they had prayed. And then after they prayed, everything else happened. Matter of fact, I still believe that happens today. Nothing happens after, uh, you know, more than until you pray. But it's when you pray, after you pray, God begins to move. Most churches' greatest mistake is, is they have lights and cameras in action, but they leave out the prayer part. And so they leave out the power part. And, uh, and so... Watch what he says. He says, and after they prayed, the Bible says the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they all they had all things common and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. I like that. That's good. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses, they sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid, upon, laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he hath need. And Hosea, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, he sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. What a word today. I, how, what is the portrait of a great church? Well, first of all, you take taking notes. Without any further ado, write this down. A great church is marked by great power. Uh, not man's great power or not money power but by the great power of the Holy Ghost of God. And I said last week, I'm going to say this week, don't let the word Holy Ghost scare you. Um, a Baptist can use the term as well as others uh, because it is the Holy Ghost. It's the, some call it the Holy Spirit. They're more comfortable with that. <clears throat> but he is the Holy Ghost according to the word of God. And the Holy Ghost brings with him great power. A great church is filled, I believe, with great power. Many, uh, you read the scripture and when you think about um, the Holy Ghost, he gives you more than what man can give you. He, uh, you know, with man, you can get good ingenuity, you can get wit, you can get human wisdom, you can get knowledgeable people, people with all kinds of degrees can do all kinds of things. But a church with great power works through supernatural power that can't be explained by man. Uh, it's possible, I believe, to have great organization, a great uh, planning and great decorations, great mechanics of a church and how things function and all those things. Great, great, great buildings and not be a great church. And I believe that can be when you don't have the great Holy Ghost of God. Amen. Um, and, 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 and I'm not being irreverent. I don't want to be irreverent. Just saying he's great. He's more than great. He's greater than great. Amen. 
But, uh, but when you, I hope you get the point that you can be all these things, and if you don't have the Holy Ghost, then you will not be a great church. Now, the great danger of this church and every other church that's living in this world today, the great danger is simply this, is that we operate in our own power, and we do what we can do, and we never tap into what God can do. And so that would be a great travesty uh, for any church and every church, no matter what that church looks like, if they're just functioning on the power that they have and not the power of the Holy Spirit of God. I don't want to be a church like that. I want us to always walk by faith and say, God, we want what you can do. We don't want what people can do. Uh, We want what you can do through people. How's that sound? Uh, One man said, he said, pray for us. Uh, A pastor not too far from here said, pray for us. I asked asked how the church was doing. He said, pray for us. He said, the blower's blowing, but the fire has long been out. And I don't ever want to be a church like that. Unfortunately, I'm probably preaching to a people like that. Where some of you, the blower is blowing, but the furnace has long been out. What do I do, Brother Jason? You ought to get on your face before God in all humility and say, God, I'd rather die than not to have the fire of God in my life. Amen. And I pray that from the youngest to the oldest one here, don't let the fire of God go out of your life. Lord, strike the match again. Amen. Uh, Light me up, Lord. Get lit for Jesus. Can you say amen? Young people know what that term is. Amen. Get lit for Jesus. So, you know, um, stoke the fires. Look in verse 33 again. There was... um, There was a multitude of them that were uh, that believed uh, and they were of one heart and one. soul. we know that there was one hundred and twenty there on that day of Pentecost. And the Bible says there were cloven tongues of fire. They were waiting there. They were praying there. We read that in the scripture a while ago. And they were looking to the Lord. They was looking to heaven, not to man. They was not saying how are we going to tell the gospel in, in, in to all these nationalities and languages. God came that day with, and, and he marked it with what he called in. I thought this is interesting to say. Cloven tongues of fire. And uh, I believe it looked like a tongue. Uh, I don't know exactly what it, nobody does, but it was a, it, he, he called it a tongue. It was a cloven tongue of fire that was over upon a, each one of those disciples' heads, apostles' heads, and they were there. And it was a mark that these are my men, and the fire of God was over their men. And it was a tongue. Let me just mention this. I don't know what you've been taught, or I, don't, I want to just tell you the truth about it. It was a, it was a cloven tongue. Uh, which teaches us that God wants us wants to use our tongue. And whenever they had a cloven tongue of fire, the Bible says that over their head, that, that every man in that place, it was imagine all these people right here. Let's just say this crowd right here, there was 50 or 60 or how many ever nationalities was here, multiple nationalities. When these men began to speak the word of God with boldness, well then something uh, supernatural began to happen in their life. The power of God gave them the this uh, amazing thing that they spoke a dialect each one of them spoke a different language that everybody in that that group there um, they heard in there the Bible says in their own language it, it wasn't a heavenly language there's no such thing in the Bible as a heavenly language it's not I challenge you to find it. it's not in there but if you look at the Greek word, it's a dialecte, dialecte, meaning a, 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 a language, a present day, a language in that day that they all heard. And so don't let anybody tell you any differently that, 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 that they, 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 there was some kind of a gibberish or whatever like that. You know, some churches I know, and I've actually had accounts with people, they teach people, say hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah. Look, it's okay to say hallelujah all you want to. Everybody say hallelujah. It's okay to say Amen. Amen, but don't, don't constitute that as speaking in tongues. Don't do that. Um, uh, tongue is a supernatural miracle from God where if, if all of you was in, let's just say all of you, Oma was, uh, she speaks German, here's another German lady. Uh, you know, Oma was a German, and let's just say I can't speak a lick of German, and so I'm up here and I'm preaching and everybody needs to understand in German, and, and all of a sudden uh, God just supernaturally infuses me with the, this, this amazing gift to be able to speak to you in a way that you can understand in German. And that's what that, that verse literally, what are you saying this for? I'm saying that to say this, it was the power of God, inexplicable, that was on them. It was undeniable, and they were so amazed, the scripture says. But listen to this verse right here, Acts chapter 2 and verse 12. Watch this verse, and I'm going to jump around too much, but I, I need to say some things. But he said in verse 12, he says, and they were all amazed, and they were, watch this, they were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? They were amazed. That's the first thing. Uh, first of all, churches that are great are amazing. Uh, the sad thing today is that so many churches, lots of money, lots of stuff, they're amusing. 
but they're not amazing. God, give us amazing churches again that can't be explained by human wit or oratory, but that the only way this can happen is by the power of the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. Uh, not by organization or anything like that. They were so amazing. Then they asked the question. Look, look at the last part of that verse. They said, what meaneth this? They said, hey, what, what, what in the world? What, what meaneth this? I mean, if these people can preach in a way that everybody here can understand in their own language, what meaneth this? And then they said, oh, they drunk with wine. Some, somebody got up and had evidently been drunk with wine before. <laughs> I know what being drunk with wine is about. Uh, they they talked like that when they drunk with wine because they didn't understand that these were all languages they were speaking about. And say, what meaneth this? They, they all drunk with wine. The next few verses goes to say, no, that, that wasn't the answer at all. And then after all they figured out, they began to figure out that this was nothing but a supernatural move of God. It wasn't a move of man. It wasn't taught. And I don't, let me just say this about the tongues thing. Uh, tongues cannot be taught by man. I mean, I can learn a different language. Yes, George, George, pretty redneck George learned a different language. Amen. Amen, George knows I love him. I mean, I remember when he was learning, huh, Polly? He struggled, but they learned another language. Uh, you can learn a language, but you can't learn how to do what these men were doing. Only God could have done that day what was done. Only God. Just mark that because if somebody comes up and tries to make you speak in tongues or teach you to speak in tongues, you rebuke them because only God can do that. And, and so that, they said, what mean is this? They figured out it was a supernatural move of God. And then if you go down in verse 37, Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, they said, with much conviction, we read about that, preached about that last Sunday. Uh, they said, what must we do? Now, they got the questions right. We get them inverted. They said, what mean it this? What must we do? Today, we bring them into church and say, well, they say, well, what must we do? Hopes to bring them closer to God. And then people saying, what mean it this? <laughs> you get it backwards, you messed up. And a lot of churches are propping people up, propping people up, and get them to do, 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 do. And then all of a sudden, uh, uh, the, all of a sudden, that's what you got a bunch of do, 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 do. <laughs> Everything goes to stinking. Why? Because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know the meaning of what they're doing. Listen, we ought to, we ought to, listen, we ought to be a church, a great church, ever great church, ought to be such a, a, a obedient to the Lord and following the Holy Spirit of God that when people walk in the doors, they'll say, what meaneth this? I mean, you're coming out in little Melder, Louisiana. You see a whole bunch of people gathering together. You see buildings being built. There's no loans being made. There's people that are just willing to get on their face before God and weep and pray. Uh, and then Wednesday night, we have people praying and weeping and then and then we see in soul say we baptized five this morning a 186 year young person and on and on and on uh two policemen and then some other the children and the young people the teenagers and what we've seen in the last several weeks listen people ought to say hey what mean is this what is all this about how's this happening how's this happening and then and then they'll ask well what can we do to help because we like this. We like this. We like what we see. We want to be a part of this. We want to buy into this. We want to, we, want to, we want to work in this. Listen, we ought to so live in a supernatural church life that other people will want to be a part of what we're doing as a church. Amen. Uh, let, well, let me just say this and I can move. Um, when we do, you won't have to beg people to come to church. When you're a supernatural church led by the Spirit of God, the anointing power of God's Spirit, then you won't have to beg people to get saved. You know, on that day they had 120 men preaching, 3,000 were saved. Today you get about 3,000 preaching, 120 may be saved. Unfo why? Because we try to operate in man's strength. And then I, I even go a step further and say this. And then we got people, I know people that condemn me and run me down because we're baptizing and seeing people. Oh, and I've been called everything charismatic and crazy. And you, I, I want to embarrass you myself by telling you other things I've been called. It, just because we're preaching the Bible and God is opening hearts and young people and old folks are saying, what mean is this and what can I do to be saved? And they want to be saved. That's the power of God. Now, I'm not, you can take that for what it's worth. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 said, Jesus said, whenever you go to this certain place, he said, um, you're going to be endued with power. Let me ask you a question, okay? With a passionate heart, I'm going to ask you this question because I don't believe that the potential that is sitting in this room right now and this crowd is meager compared to what we usually have when people are all here together. I don't believe we even taste a little bit of the potential of the lives that God has given to us in this church. 
But let me ask you this question. Are you endued with power? See, if you have the Holy Spirit of God, then there's no reason that um, you shouldn't have the power of God on your life. So I'm not talking about a staticism and I'm not talking about superficial energy, but I'm talking about the power that whenever people walk up to you, or let me just say it like this, they will want to come up to you and talk to you and say, why are you the way you are? I mean, or they just kind of want to gravitate you and hang around you because you're different than them and they're miserable in their worldly life and they look at you and they, they get a hunger for the God that you serve. That's power. I don't look at power as, as people running the aisles. I preach in churches where they tried that stuff. And I, I don't look at power where they're slaying in the spirit and cutting people down and dresses flying up and all that. I, I don't, I, you can take, be mad at me all you want to. But I believe the power of the Holy Spirit of God is whenever a person of God that profess the name of God, listen, they have, they have influence with others. They're like this guy named Barnabas who was in that verse for a reason. He was a man of consolation. He had a testimony of an encourager, of someone that people just gravitated, gravitated to and wanted to be around. They would li- I believe they'd listen to Barnabas when he taught. And, and Barnabas, I believe, was a soul winner. I believe that whenever Barnabas walked in the room, things got brighter and lighter. That's the power of God. Wednesday night we talked about the light, praying for the light. Listen, light is power. These lights are powerful. They brighten everything up, heat everything up. Amen. And, 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 they're, they're, and that's the way God wants us to be. We're living past the time, or let me just say it like this. It is past time that Christians get, on the, get past the mediocrity and say, God, give me power again. Light my fire, Lord. Let me ask you this question. Are you spirited? Are you spirited? That is, you know, uh, do, do you believe that God's spirit gives you energy? On a day-to-day basis. Well, I'm not asking you if you believe in the Spirit. See, if you, have the, if you are saved, then you have the Spirit of God. But if you uh, are spirited, I believe it's the, it's the power of the Spirit of God that abides on your life. And you won't, now watch this. How does that look, Brother Jason? You won't have to interject yourself on people. That is, there would be such a, a spirit in you, supernatural, that permeates through you by spending time with God that people will listen to you because they'll know you of a different sort. How do I get that, Brother Jason? Prayer. Uh, this morning, I, I, on a, last night I had a bad night at 8 o'clock. I'm not whining on you. I'm, just, I'm real when I get in the pulpit. I, I had a migraine yesterday about 8 o'clock. I, I'm dealing with some knuckleheads. And, uh, and, and I, I went to bed. I was nauseated. Boy, I got an ice pack wrapped around my head and fell asleep. Boy, and I was out. And I woke up about 3 this morning and I was up. And, uh, and I felt like I was in heaven. I mean, I, I was, I, it would have been good to be in heaven. But I wasn't in heaven. But I felt like I was in heaven. If you ever had one of those things, you know what I'm talking about. So I get up, I don't have nothing else to do, so I go in there on the couch, and I know what I'm preaching to you is true. And I'm not blowing my horn, I just want to be an example to you. I get on my face on the side of my couch, and I begin to pray. And I begin to say, God, if there's any wicked way within me, show me. If there's any uncleanliness or dirty thoughts or or, 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 or whatever, if I'm coveting things I shouldn't be, if I'm lusting after things, I should, then Lord God, here it is. And I spent, I don't know how much time on the side of that couch, just me and him before anybody messed my day up. Amen. And God just gives me his power. And, and, and after being drained from a migraine, I didn't feel like preaching today, but it's my second time and I'm ready to go a third one. I'm ready. No, because not because of me, but because of him. And so I'm just saying that to you that the Bible commands us, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit of God. It's a commandment. Do y'all see that say amen, grunt snort? It is a command of God that we are filled with the Spirit of God. Now, I'm going to ask you again, are you spirited? Oh, I don't get real spirited, Brother Jason. I don't, I, yeah. Okay, let me go to a ball game with you. See how spirited you get. Because I know how they work at them ball games. I've been to them. I, I've been to them. I've seen my family get kicked out of them before. They get kind of spirited. I ain't going to call no names, but uh, uh, I, 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 I know they'll climb the fence. I know that. I know that. I know they'll throw stuff, and they'll holler stuff, and they'll, and, 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 and they'll speak in tongues there. I know that. 
Because why, brother? They, they get spirited. Right? You get spirited at a ball game, right? Just don't get spirited at church. Is that right? I mean, is that right? We get spirited, but just not at church. Because after all, we've got to be reverent here. And I believe in reverence, but I believe, folks, listen, if anything excites you and spirits you, gets you more spirited than Jesus, then something's wrong with you. Amen. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not picking, but I'm just saying we ought to get spiritual about Jesus. Well, there was great power. Second thing is this. Is there was, if you want to see a portrait of a good church, of a great church, there's great, not only great power, there's great grace. And verse 33 tells us that. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the re- resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Great grace. Now, what is grace? God's riches is at Christ's expense. We've heard that before. God's riches at Christ's expense. I said, Lord, give me another definition of how I can explain grace. Let me tell you what grace is to me. It's that desire and that power to do the will of God. That's what grace is. Some people think, well, grace is whenever I get a bunch of good riches from God, you know, and I, I, he gives me money and he gives me things. He gives me materialism and all that. Hey, wonderful. Praise God if he's giving you things like that. Hey, the Bible says the Lord, desi- uh, he loves the prosperity of his children. Wonderful. I'm not a prosperity preacher, but wonderful. And who don't like prosperity? Amen. <laughs> no, amen. Well, the rest of you, I want to see you after a while. I want to bankrupt you and give me all your money. If you don't like prosperity, Amen. Quiet in here now, ain't it? But what is grace? Is it just getting a bunch of stuff? No. Let me tell you what grace is. It's when God gives us this, the desire and the power to do His will. Listen, if I didn't have the grace of God, you know what keeps me from following the grace of God? You know what keeps me preaching? I know many of you probably don't know that, but what keeps me preaching is the grace of God. He gives me the desire to move, the desire to witness, the desire to preach, the desire to pray. He gives me the desire to do His will. That's the grace of God. And with that comes great riches. With that comes great blessings and so on. And I know all that. But I'm just saying that the early church, there was a great church because they had the grace of God. They had the desire and the power in the midst of persecution to do that which is pleasing to a holy and a righteous God. Amen. When that grace was upon them, well, they preached 3,000 people and one day was saved and grace fell on them. The desire and power to do the will of God fell on them that day. Do you know why you're saved? Because you're a recipient of grace. Amen. If you never receive the grace of God, you're not saved. And you receive the grace of God, you receive the desire God gives you and the power God gives you to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody here said yes to Jesus? Amen. Then you have received grace. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let me, let me just say that it's, it's, uh, it's the desire to do the will of God. Third thing is this. Is that not only was there great power, great grace. This third one is the one that we'll kind of retract from if we're not careful. But you'll read in chapter 5. If you'll look with me one more chapter over in verse 5. You'll see a story of a guy and a girl named Ananias and Sapphira. And you'll find that the Bible says they were making all things common. That is, they were selling their stuff. They were giving it uh, all to one pot. And some would say, that's socialism. I don't believe it at all. That's not socialism. They were just providing for the kingdom of God work. And may I say, nothing you give to the Lord will you ever regret that God will always, you know, shovel back out. You shovel in, he shovels out. He got a bigger shovel than you, amen. And uh, but disobedience to do so will bring uh, can bring great uh, judgment on a life. Notice what he said in this verse in chapter five, verse five. I'm going to read the verses in Ananias hearing the words. He, she fell down. Watch this and gave up the ghosts and great fear came on all them that heard these things. Um, uh, I tell you what, just for understanding sake, allow me to back up a few verses. Um, verse um, number uh, two, one and two. Let's just start in the first. Certain person named, uh, man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of a price. His wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Brought a certain part. Now watch this. They, they were into the look good and, and so forth. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Now here's the Holy Ghost again. He's in control. He's leading. He's moving. And I believe he still does. Amen. I believe he leads you in what to give, leads you in what to do. But I believe that every soul in this room right now can lie to the Holy Ghost. 
That is, you can project one thing and do something else and lie to the Holy Ghost. And, and to keep back part, watch this, verse 4. While it remained, was it not in your hand? And in other words, did you not have the responsibility to do this, Ananias? And, and watch the next part. And after it was sold, was it not in your own power? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? Has you not lied unto men but unto God? You, he, so he, they're pegged now. And then they'll watch, now this is where we began. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, gave up the ghost. That means he died. And verse 6, and the young men uh, came, wound him up, and uh, carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And, it, and Peter answered unto him, uh, unto her, tell me, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. Giving her a chance to be honest. Isn't God good? God gives us a chance just to be honest. And he give us a chance here this morning, all of you, just to be honest one more time. And, but watch what he said. There's so much to preach here, but what? And, and, and the Bible says, and, and um, tell me whether you sold the lamb for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, how is it that you have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried your husband are at the door and shall carry you out also. Then she fell straight down or down straightway at his feet. Yielded up the ghost, and the young men came, found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon them all, or all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. Now, and let me just read a little further. And, and by, the, by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all in one accord under Solomon's porch. Let me just stop there, and I'll read some more from that in a moment. Great fear came upon them all. One of the things that we have lost today in churches, big churches, small churches, is we've lost something called the fear of the Lord. Um, I, I, I just, I don't know how to preach this, but to say that um, Ananias and Sapphira, they lost that. Uh, they, were, they were required of God. They were professing to be among the number of God. And they were required to just be obedient to God, uh, to be honest before God. And somehow greed got in their heart, lust got in their heart, and they lied to God. And, um, and God took their life and he killed them right there on the spot. Now let me just say, he doesn't kill everybody who lies. I mean, if he did, where would, I mean, I'd be the only one left. I mean, in, I'm just joking, you know that. We'd all be dead. Isn't that, can I hear an amen? There ain't not a liar in this place. You, everybody's told a lie. Um, and saying I hadn't lied, that'd be your first one, amen, or second one at least. But, but, but Ananias and Sapphira lied, and God doesn't destroy every liar for lying. Well, he destroyed them, though. Why? As an example. Just like God doesn't destroy every country and burn it with fire like he did Sodom and Gomorrah, but he did Sodom and Gomorrah. He sent fire down from heaven and consumed them uh, to utter ashes. And, but God doesn't destroy every nation like that or he could destroy America today. Can he, Brother Jason? Absolutely he can. And why would you say that, Brother Jason? Because it causes fear up, to come upon our heart. Let me just give you some verses. Psalms 111, verse 70, or verse, uh, verse 10 says, the, the beginning of wisdom is to fear the Lord. Or the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Do you know one of the greatest things everybody in this room can do is lay your intellectual pride in the dust, lay your arrogance in the dust, lay your haughtiness in the dust, and tremble before God? You ought to make sure you tremble before God. Uh, the last three weeks of my life, I, I don't know what the Lord has been doing in my life, but I do know this, that my heart trembles before Him. I, I, I'm amazed uh, because I, I've asked Him for it. I want it. I, I want to fear the Lord more than any man, more than any circumstance in my life, more than any situation that I face. We must fear the Lord. That's the beginning of all wisdom. Let me give you another verse. The Bible says in Psalms 19, 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, uh, enlightening the eyes. That is, when we fear the Lord, uh, as we ought to fear the Lord as a church, but more so, churches are made of people, individuals sitting in that pew. Uh, every one of us ought to pray, Dear God, let your fear be upon my heart. But see, I know us, we wear these t-shirts now, or used to, a big fad that went around, says, No fear. We, the devil has taught us we don't have to fear nothing. Uh, but you listen to me, that would be a foolish thing to do, to fear nothing. Uh, I, I fear drought. I fear famine. I fear snakes. I beat one to death last week. I, I fear snakes. I, I, I fear people that don't fear the Lord. They'll be the ones that'll come into a school and kill all our kids. 
They'll be the ones that will try to come in this door and shoot us all up because they have no fear of God in their eyes. And, and so what are you saying, Brother Jason? I'm saying that, that every one of us ought to get on our face at some point, maybe even this morning, and say, Dear God, teach me to fear you again. Help my heart to tremble before you again and learn to fear the Lord. Why? Because the Bible says God's secret is with those that fear Him. You want to know the deep things of God? The, you want to know the will of God? Then you need to ask God to help you, teach you to fear Him. Let me tell you about a person that doesn't fear Him. They'll be the person that they'll just do whatever they want to do. Um, Judges, the book of Judges teaches us of a people in that day that said this. It said this, the testimony of their life in that day was this. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. I know this is negative, but I believe we're there again in the church today. Everybody dresses the way they want to dress. They act the way they want to act. I, I've been, I deal with people that do whatever they want to do and they, they somehow justify it in their heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. It's wicked. What man can know it? The Bible also says, listen to this, that the heart is deceitful and it can justify whatsoever it wishes. What's the answer, Brother Jason? It's to fear the Lord. And say, God, what do you say? God, what do you say? God, what do you want? God, what do you... What is the fear of the Lord? It's when you reverence God first. I've never seen a day. I've never seen a day like today. And I'm, this is negative. This is just true. You'll, don't shoot the messenger. When most people today are worrying more about themselves than God. How do I feel? Not how God feels. What do I say? Not what God says. What do I think? Not what God thinks. And it is a prophecy of the last days in 2 Timothy. He said, um, or 1 Timothy, I believe it is. He said, and, and in the last days, people will be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. Why? Because we lose the fear of God. Fear of God. Every parent ought to be teaching their kids. I'm glad to have the parents that I had. I, uh, they weren't perfect. There's no perfect parents at all anyway, but... But I loved them and they loved me and they taught me something. They taught me that I better fear God. My mama used to teach us things like this. God will kill you. <laughs> Did, am I lying? She would tell us that because she had three, three teenage boys at one time. What else are you going to do? Bring God on them. Amen. He's going to kill you. And then two girls come along. and I mean, you know, so she had five kids. I mean, she had to have God. I mean... And, and I'll tell you this, that I'll never forget. My mama, I've shared this testimony a lot, that she, many, she put the fear of God in our life. And my dad would too, with a belt, amen. And, uh, and, and, and she would say, the last thing I remember very clearly spiritually with my mother is that she said, I turned you over to the Lord. Because she believed God, to fear God first. And she turned us over to the Lord. I believe great people are made like that. And I believe great churches are made like that. Folks, we ought to teach our kids the fear of the Lord. We want to make sure that they know, hey, uh, that, that if God wants to get them, He can get them any minute. He, they better fear Him. Ask Ananias and Sapphira. Amen. That story is in the Bible as an example to us. Not that God's going to go and kill. Does God still kill liars? Yes. Yes. I believe that. I believe God can take a liar out just like that. I believe just like He can take an immoral person out just like that. Why? Because God is a severe God. Yes. He's a loving God. Yes. But we don't just say God is a God of love. That's the age we're living in. God is a God of love. And He is a God of love. And God is love. Wonderful. Praise God. Amen. But a half of truth is a whole lie. The same God that is a God of love. Jonathan Edwards, I believe, preached that sermon and said, Sinners will fall in the hands of an angry God. And we ought to preach that God is an angry God. There's nobody here a match for God. Nobody likes that preaching anymore. But so we have become so so. Sad in our preaching. Let me read the old prophet Jeremiah. He was known as the weeping prophet. A while ago, the Holy Spirit put on my heart right over there. Uh, Jeremiah said this. He says, It's not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, and it's like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. That's so far from the God we hear today or the Bible we know today. He said, my, my rock is like a fire. Uh, he said, my, my, uh, and it's like a hammer. He says, and watch this what he says. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, that is, preachers, 
uh, that said, uh, prophet, uh, against the prophet, saith the Lord, that steal my words one from his neighbor. Behold, I'm against the prophet, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, he saith. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams and, and uh, saith the Lord and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their, what's here? Listen to this word. All this I read to read this one more. And by their lightness. Their lightness. I'm, he talking about preachers. That are, he says, I'm against them because they lie and they err by their lightness. Yet, yet I sent them not nor commanded them. Therefore, they'll not profit this people that all said the Lord, said the Lord. Let me just stop right there. They'll not at all profit. He said, my, my word's like a hammer. My word's like a fire. He said, but you got these preachers, so-called preachers that get behind pulpits today. We may call them liberals. I don't know what you call them. mealy mouth light preachers that don't want to say, hey, sin is going to kill you. Hell is hot. God is a God to be feared. And we don't have a God like that no more. God said, I'm against that. I'm against that. Now, I'm not into mean preaching and mean-spirited preaching, but I am into preaching the truth. And God says he's against the lightness, the lightness. Why? Because eternity is too long to be wrong. Great churches have great fear, great reverence, great respect for a great God. And they'll repel people. They'll retract people. But you let God do what he does. Amen. I believe we ought to be friendly. I believe we ought to be loving. I believe we ought to be, um, we ought to sound right. I believe the AC ought to work. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I ain't against those things. But I do, and I do believe this with all my heart. We need to always be careful. To stay with the word of God, whether everybody likes it or nobody likes it. Amen. And it'll cause fear. I, I, it, it, it'll cause fear to come upon, upon people if we'll preach the truth of the word of God. And I know, I know um, everybody not love me for preaching the way I preach. And no, and they don't. And I, if I preach lighthearted, I'd probably fill this place up ten times over. But I'll just tell you this, that what we need more than, than people liking the preacher is we need people to respect a holy God. Because of what God can do. And so we ought not compromise. So you pray for me. Amen. Um, because it's tough sometimes. Just saying thus saith the Lord. Uh, fourth thing is this. Is that great churches only have great fear for God. But they have great joy. And I'm going to be quicker. So don't get me out. Oh man I got plenty of time. Um, great joy on churches. Thank God for joy. Look in chapter 8. I'm in Acts chapter 8 and verse 6. He said this. Now look at this. He says. Let me turn over here and I'll read it. What he said. He said in, in verse number 6 of chapter 8, he said these words. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spoke, hearing and seeing the miracles. Underscore that word, the miracles that he did. Now, what, what do you read that verse for? Well, you'll find the first missionaries, and here's the ministry of Brother Philip. He's starting off, and notice what he said. He said, with one accord they gave heed. That is, they told forth about what he called them, the miracles. Now, now, what does that do for you? Let me tell you what miracles will do for you. Do you believe in miracles? I believe in miracles. I, I, I don't believe that we're in the signs of the miracles like it was in Jesus' day. But I do believe in miracles probably greater than ones you see in the Bible. And I do. Salvation is one of them. Grace is a miracle. Amen. The mercy of God is a miracle. Amen. Why God hadn't killed some of you, I just, it's just a miracle. Amen. Amen. I could just say me. Amen. Miracles are everywhere. They're all around you. But let me, let me just touch this point for a second. They, he gave heed to the miracles. And Philip said, hey, hey, hey. And he was preaching behind a pulpit. Went, hey, remember the thousands that were fed? And they remembered the miracles of the feeding of the 5,000. Remember the lame man that was 38 years beside the pool of Bethesda that was crippled, couldn't walk? And then Jesus come along one day and he said, rise, take up your bed and walk. And he did. And he did. Uh, do you remember the um, do you remember the man that was blind there begging for alms? And, and, uh, and, and all of a sudden he, he received his sight. He saw men walk around like trees. Remember the other man that he, Jesus spit and made some mud spill and put it on his eyes, told him to go wash. He washed. He went seeing. You remember the guy that was sitting at the gate begging for alms and, and Peter Peter and James walked out and they, they come by him. They said, hey, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I to you. And he got up and walked. I mean, and he just went through all. Remember, Jesus walked on the water one night in the middle of a, of a hurricane. Remember that miracle? There was a man uh, one time that, that got struck with leprosy. And oh, it was a bunch. And then Jesus healed them and sent them on their way. Miracle. Can you imagine the joy that those guys had when they remembered the miracles? Anybody hear me today? 
the miracles. I know I have joy when I remember the miracle of how the Lord saved my soul. It gives me joy in the midst of all my burdens. Anybody here have any miracles? Here a miracle, there a miracle, millions of little miracles. They ought to give us all joy. Why does God give us the miracles that we have? Well, what miracles, Brother Jason? Well, you hold that little baby in your hand? Heather got five little miracles. I got three little miracles that have grown up now. Anybody here have any miracles? I mean, you ever seen a birth? My first baby, Cameron, was born. I'm like, good night. This is amazing. Scared to death, running behind the door. The next one, I was up on the shoulder of Becky looking. At, oh, man, here's another miracle. And the next one, I was down there by the doctor saying, hey, come on, baby. Miracles, miracles, miracles. Let me, let me tell you a miracle is unnoticed here today. All right, ready? Just the miracle that God gives us a breath today. It, it really is, but we don't see them as miracles, and that's why they don't give us joy anymore. Just you being here is a miracle. And the devil somehow makes us look at everything that's bad, but I'm going to tell you that there's, a, there's miracles on every corner if you just stop and look at them. Sun rising in the east is a miracle every day. It's just a wonderful miracle. Just sun rising up and all of its brilliance just praising God. What a miracle that is. I mean, marriage is a miracle. Amen. It's a miracle you made it this long. Amen. Just miracle after miracle after miracle. I mean, really. But uh, somehow we've been brainwashed to think that the only miracles are the ones we read about in the Bible. When the blind see and the thousands were fed and the lame walk. No. There's miracles a day. Why do we have miracles a day? Because God wants to give us joy every day because great churches have great joy. Now listen, listen, hear, hear this. We ought to be given a shout of joy every day for the great things God is doing. Every day for the great things God is doing. Life ought to never get boring for us. And mamas and daddies, let me help you with this. This story I I was told this morning early there was a guy about six foot nine, big old tall guy come walking in the aisle. And this little bitty woman behind her, she, he got up, she got up and he was coming forward and she just started shouting, Amen, glory to God. And started doing her hands like that in there. Glory to God, hallelujah, praise the Lord. In a Baptist church too. And I mean, she, she was still, she was just cutting loose, man. Hey, praise God. Well, they asked her, what, what are you, so, come here, what are you, what are you doing? She said, that's my boy. And he's going to give his life to Jesus today. That's my boy. And she was just, great joy was on. And great, what, what, shouldn't we do the same thing? I mean, we, who, who told us to get over the joy of God saving us? Who told us to get over the joy of God saving our kids? Maybe we ought to get past our pout and God give us a little shout. And he would if we get under the spout where the glory comes out. Amen. So... Where's your joy? Anybody here have any joy today? It, then you ought to notify yourself. Amen. It's okay. I'm not a joy boy. I'm going to just be honest and tell you. But I tell you about 4 o'clock this morning, I had joy in my heart on the side of my couch, just kneeling down, thanking my God for delivering me from a migraine and thanking my God for this church, praying for many of you, praying for my family, praying for God to do something in a supernatural way. And, and, and listen, I, I just can't explain the joy. Lord, Jesus said, I come to give you joy and that your joy may be full and that your joy may remain. And don't you let the devil steal your joy. I'm preaching to some of you who are guilty of that this morning. You let an old smut-faced devil take you, a person who is sealed with the Spirit of God, put you through circumstances and steal your joy from you. You ought to repent of that and say, God, I am sorry for letting the devil steal my joy. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. And you lose the pout and you get you a shout again. Amen. For the glory of God. Amen. And some of you need to hear that today. Great churches have great joy. And then great churches have great boldness. He said in Acts chapter 4, And with great boldness they proclaim the word of God. The Bible says that righteous, the righteous shall be as bold as a lion. Bold to witness. What did they do? They was boldly witnessing of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some of you big strong men here, you, you think you're strong, you're tough, you can whip anything that moves, but you're a coward without the boldness of the Holy Spirit of God to witness the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you, you can see people that are strong as an ox and big and tough and all bad and all that, but you're too scared 
to tell people around you about the love of Jesus Christ and how Jesus, listen, listen, Jesus got out of that grave. It takes boldness to do that. You know why? Because they're going to go, <laughs> you believe a dead man got out of the grave? You idiot. You idiot. Amen. I mean, if they, if they laugh at you and persecute you, there's always a backup plan. Amen? No, I'm joking with you. I mean, not really. But I mean, you know, we ought to be so bold to say, hey, the Bible says that Jesus rose from the grave and Jesus gave his life for us and he died and he rose from the grave in order for you to be saved and me to be saved. And what is so boldly be able to proclaim that God gives us a church with what we call holy boldness. And two times in that passage, they spoke the word of God with boldness. The first 29 says, and with all boldness, they spoke the word of God. Listen, we want to button our lips and we're being taught by the culture. Button your lip. And we're talking about the school and the government and everybody else. Button your lip. Don't speak the word of God. And that's why we're living in a biblically illiterate society today where nobody knows the Word of God because we've been told to shut up and we believe them. We think we've got to dumb it down. We've got to cower back. No! God wants you to stand up, church. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. You soldiers of the cross. Speak the Word of God. Don't be ashamed of Him. Don't be ashamed of Him. Be bold. And then the fifth thing, I got to move. Sixth thing, whatever. Great unity was in the church. The Bible says they were of one accord. They were of one accord. Now watch this. One accord and they were one heart. I like that. One heart and one soul. Verse 32. They believe were one heart and one soul. Do you know how important unity is to the church today? You know that the Bible teaches us that God puts unity in a body? He does that. Ephesians says that we're to preserve the unity of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to touch this. I'm going to move. Because we have sweet unity here. And God, may God help us to keep it. Amen. Anybody believe that? Say amen. amen. I mean, God is, man, we, we were here yesterday with those men. Leon, I tell you, when we overwork in that building, it's just unity, just sweet harmony. God is good. The devil hates it. The devil hates it. But here, 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 here's what the Bible says. Now watch this. You, every individual in these pews, you are to preserve the unity of the Spirit. Preserve it. Even if it means what I've had to do through the years, kick some people out. If you're going to, be, if you're going to start strife and division and animosity in here, you just go and do that somewhere else. You ain't going to do it up in here. And we do that by the grace of God. We beck in repentance. We try that and all that. But many churches in rural areas are splitting and splintering. They go and start a new, a new work. And this thing over here and that thing over there. And we got 5,000 churches that are boarding their windows up. And why? Because they can't get along. Why? Because they get, they get uh, struggles among the myths. Everybody wants to be somebody. No, let me tell you the way to have a real church. Everybody just say, we all going to be God's little nobody. We all going to decrease. And we're going to let God increase. And that's how you preserve the unity of the Spirit of God. I've seen people whistle in here and say, boy, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I, and I say, they ain't going to last long. Because that doesn't gel with unity. Amen? I'm just saying great churches have great unity. Let me just help you with this and I'll move to the last couple of things. And that's it. You know how you have unity? Don't do anything to not have unity. That was brilliant, wasn't it? Took me all week to come up with that one. You know how you have unity? You, you just, sometimes you just got to keep your mouth shut. Sometimes you just got to pull a brother or a sister off the side and say, look, I, I want you to know in the name of Jesus Christ, I love you. I'd sure like to talk to you about this. I feel this way. And then, you know what I find? 99% of the time when I think they feel this way and I feel this way, it ain't nothing like that. It ain't nothing but the devil dividing the mind. Anybody with me snort, grunt, say amen? And so that's why communication is important. And I, you, I may think, it, they hate my guts. When I talk to them, they say, you hate me. <laughs> they think I hate their guts. I'm talking about unity. You've got, he said, that's your responsibility as a church. You preserve it. I'm talking about how to be a great church. And I can take you right now, not far from this church, the churches that, man, they are like this. And the membership is tanking like this because of no unity. See, 
The seventh thing is this. There will be great provision. Chapter 4 verse 34 says. Now watch what he says. In verse 34. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many were possessor of lands, houses, they sold them. They brought the prices of things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according to what he had need. And Hosea, by uh, the apostles whose name was Barnabas, uh, being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite of the country of Sabah, having land, sold it, brought the money, and laid it at his apostles' feet. I often wonder why they singled out Brother Barnabas. Probably because he was a very respected man that had much. When you study the life of Barnabas, but he didn't let much do him like the rich young ruler, what it did to him. The rich young ruler turned away and went away because he had much possessions. Barnabas said, no, I'm just going to be part of the program. And I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And I'm not going to think I'm better than anybody else. Amen. Now, here's my point is that they had great, great provision. Why, why does God provide? He provides for his glory. Do you understand that everything God gives to me is not for me? Everything God, I, God taught me this years ago, the Holy Ghost of God taught me this, that I'm just a channel. That's all I am, is a channel. He channels sermons through me. He channels money through me. He channels joy through me. He channels uh, peace to me through me. I, I don't know how he does all that, but he just does it as you obey him. You know, uh, I've had people say weird things like, when I talk to you, I feel so calm, you know. And I'm like, well, I wish I could feel that way. I mean, I don't care. We're just, now watch this. Channels of blessing. God wants to channel something through you for, the glory, for His glory and the benefit and edification of other people. I wish we'd all know that. And we would just say, God, remember the old hymn, I, don't, I can't sing it, I won't sing it. He said, make me a channel of blessing today. Make me a channel of blessing, I pray. Channels of blessing. And, and so, you know, there, there's, there was great provision. And God wants to provide for His church. And God does provide for His church. And that's one of the supernatural things about the church is that, you know, uh, we're just a bunch of people coming together that God has called together. And all of a sudden, people, uh, you're not selling a product or anything like that. And then people just give their money and hopefully a, at least a tenth. And then offerings above that. And then they give and then they provide. And the work that God's provided for. And, and I do believe that we're way off key of what it ought to be. Someone said, and I believe this, that if everybody who professed the name of Christ did pay a tithe, then we never have to worry about where our kids go to college, never have to worry about buildings being built, never have to worry about medical hospitals and all of that. God knows what he's doing. If we'd just be obedient to what he said, it'd be to everybody's good. And then I'm, I'm going to be through with this last point. Great picture of a great church. There are seven of them. The last one is this, and this is the one I harped on last week and this week. Great number of souls being saved. You know, I don't believe that, let me, let me give you a verse, Acts chapter 11, verse uh, 21, and this will be our last verse or two here. Acts eleven twenty one. 21, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and watch this, a great number believed, and they turned to the Lord. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed. You know how we're going to keep seeing souls saved, and some of your babies are going to get saved, and some of your neighbors are going to get saved, and some of your family members are going to get saved, some of you are going to get saved. Let me tell you how. When the hand of the Lord is with us, it'll just keep on happening. Because God will show himself faithful and God will show himself mighty. People say, well, Brother Jason, you're always harping on them numbers. I'm not interested in numbers. I, I, uh, I'm just, I've heard preachers say, it ain't about the numbers. <laughs> I want everybody to look at me. It's about the numbers. It's about the numbers. I don't want to be many and not much, but I'm going to tell you this right now. I want to be a growing church with growing souls. I said this last Sunday. I'm going to sound like a broken record this Sunday. I want you to listen. I want to see five baptized. I want to see 500 baptized. I want to see 3,000 in one day baptized. Whatever it takes, I want to see. Because I'm interested. Because every number is a soul. Every soul is going to heaven or every soul is going to hell. You ain't going to go. You're going to one or the other. And, and we as a church are required to reach the soul of man with the word of God. That's my burden. That's my hunger. I want to be a soul winner. I believe great churches have soul winning at its core value. Then you can, If you don't believe that, you can't explain the early church. One of the first days of the church, 3,000 were saved. 
Then another count, 5,000 were saved. Then another count, many were saved. And then this count said, many believe. We don't even know the number. All Jerusalem was filled with him. He goes on to say, well, I ain't interested in numbers. <laughs> I told him this morning, I'm going to tell you this, and I'm interested in numbers with you. If you're not interested in numbers, I'd really like to see you after church, okay? Because I got some dollar bills in my wallet over there. I'm going to trade for your $100 bills, okay? If you're not interested in numbers. Oh, you are interested in numbers. Really. You're just not interested in God's numbers. Amen, Brother Jason. Boy, it's quiet in here. We are interested in numbers. But we're just not interested in God's numbers. See, because you'd never change me a, trade me a $100 bill for a dollar bill. I'd be your friend all week long. Amen? Anyway, point made. Every soul's a number. Every soul can be reconciled or lost or will be reconciled to the Lord or lost. And Jesus' mission in this world was this, to come. The Bible says, Luke 19, 22, he said, he come to, Son of Man came to seek and to save those who were lost. And so God help us to do that and give us the grace to do that and never let the baptistry get dry. Amen. Never let the baptistry get dry. But by the grace of God, Take the gospel of God and tell them the desire of God that not any should perish, but that all should come to repentance so that they may receive the will of God and give their life to God and forever and forever be saved by the grace of God. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, I'll come and I'll make you fishers of men. Are you a fisher of men? Great churches are. Great people that constitute great churches, I believe, are fishing for men every day. I talk to every one of you as much as I can. And listen to me, every one of you, I'm wondering, every one of you, I'm wondering, are you saved or are you lost? Amen. Amen. Why? Because I don't want your blood required on my hands when we die and get before our Father in heaven. Amen. Because that's going to happen one day. Some will have, be sitting on a church pew. They'll die and go to heaven, stand before God. There'll be blood dripping through their fingers. Because they never told the saving grace of God to those that God put in their midst. I'll close on a lighter note. Nothing sweeter than to be a fisher of men. When you're fishing for fish, you guys, Cody, you know what I'm talking about. You, fish, you catch that fish and you bring them out of that dark, murky water. You bring them into a, a bad play. I mean, well, let me, let me just say it right. You bring them into his environment that he loves in the water. You bring them into a bad place because he's going into Lake Crisco. Amen. And uh, amen. But when you're fishing for men, here's what you do. You catch them and you bring them out of a bad, bad place there. And you bring them into the wonderful light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why wouldn't anybody want to do that? Witness is somebody. I believe we've been duped about it all. I believe we've been told that we, you know, we, we're not to witness the people. We're not to tell people about Jesus. We're not to give them a clear presentation of the gospel. We're not to help them pray and ask Jesus to come in their heart, forgive them for the sins. Oh, no, no, no. No, I, I believe otherwise. I believe we ought to lead them to Christ. I mean, I know you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. But I believe we ought to lead them as close to the water as we can. And then let them taste a fresh drink of that water. Amen. And follow in love, fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we say today? God's picture of a great church. There it is on your screen. Great churches made of great people. Great people that make up great churches have great power. You have power in your life. If not, why don't you just get on your knees this morning and say, God, and just be honest with him. Get on your knees and say, God, I want your power. For me, it was on a graveside of my mother in Cryer Cemetery years ago, about six months in the ministry. I'd take my Bible, it'd shake like a leaf in my hand. I said, oh God, I, I ain't preaching no more if I can't get past this nervous condition and just crazy. I told Jaden about this story this week. I was shy, I'd hide behind the door at my grandma's house. I remember my mama died, changed my life in, in this aspect because I was fixing to quit the ministry. I got on the side of that cold concrete slab in that graveyard with nobody around and I wept tears on that, on that vault and I said, God, I need your power in my life. I need your power. I don't know what happened that day, but God gave me power, and I'm saying that with humility, with utter humility. 
that God has given me power to preach, and I want to preach. I have a desire to preach. I need to preach. I want to help people, but I have to have the power of God. And then great grace. I've been a recipient of the grace of God. I desire the will of God. I grieve when I get out of the will of God, and I've fallen out of the will of God before. Great people have great fear. I fear the Lord. My heart, even today, preaching to you, I tremble on the inside. I really do. I can you explain it? I can't explain it. But I'll tell you, my heart trembles before him, knowing that I've got to get this right. I've got to preach this right. Unless I stand before a God that's going to bring me into contempt if I say something to mislead you. And great joy. I love joy. I have joy in my heart in the midst of the heavy burdens I'm carrying even today. I have Joy deep down in my heart, it sets the barometer for my life. Then there's great boldness. I want to preach with boldness, but I don't, never want you to think that I'm an arrogant guy because I'm not. I am nothing without Jesus. I am absolutely a zero with the edges trimmed off without Jesus Christ. But I know boldness and pride and arrogance has, should have no place in the life of a believer. And then there's the unity and the provision. And lastly, the soul saved. Lord's allowed me to win a lot of people to Christ. I want to win more. I want you to know there's no greater thing in this world than to see what you've seen this morning. People who say yes to Jesus Christ. My Aunt Sue told me this. I'm going to share with her testimony. She said, and I wouldn't plan on this. I just think the Lord's leading me to say this. But my Aunt Sue told me that when she was, uh, her son's right back here. She told me in my office, she said, you know, when I was a little girl, there was a preacher. I won't say his name. He was preaching. He was one of them hellfire preachers, you know, like we are. And, and, um, and, and, and he said, hey, kids, you better get up and come and give your life to Jesus. You're all going to hell. And she said, all the kids jumped up and they ran to the altar and they just gave their life to Jesus. You know? And the problem is that there was no conviction, no compunction, no, no, there wasn't no change in the heart. She said, for all these years, I've wondered about that. Keith and I talked about it. We uh, Aunt Sue and I talked about it the other day in my office, and she said, and, and I'm just tired of worrying about it. And I want to give my life to Christ because I've never been saved. She's 85, it'll be 86. And I give God the glory for that. And I thought about her life, and I think about many of you here this morning. Some of you are old, one foot in the grave, one on the banana peel. You're fixing to go. You ain't going to stay here forever. Your life's like a vapor, and you're going to be gone. Are you going to be ready to meet your Lord? Are you going to be ready to die? Those who are not ready to live, they're not ready to die. Becky, I want you to come. Casey, you come. But let me ask you this question. If you were to die today, every one of you in this place, whether you're a senior adult or young person, I say this with a burden for every one of you. Could you honestly, in your heart of hearts, I want you to look at me, and I want you to be honest. With great honesty, I want you to answer this. Can you say... As a young adult, 20, 15, 20, 30 years old, 80 years old, if I died today, Pastor Jason, I know I'd go to heaven. If you can't say that, I want you to know this. Just like those two back there, just like this young man over here, the other young man, Aubrey, all of you can say what they've said. Yes, I want this to be right. I believe if the God of the ages is in your heart, it won't take you long to find that out. If you don't know, it's probably because he's absent. Now, I'm talking to you about more than religion. I don't want you to become a Baptist, a Pentecostal, a Methodist, a Catholic. I'm talking about becoming a Christian. And if you're here this morning and say, Pastor, I, I've been waiting on this for a long time, and I just want to be a Christian. I, I want to give my heart to Jesus, and I want to know, but know where I'm going when I die, then today's your day. And I want you to bow your head and I want you to pray this prayer of repentance of your sin and asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart if that's what you want. Everybody here, even our guests for the first time that are here, those watching us live all around the, literally the United States today and the world through social media, why don't you pray this? Dear Lord Jesus, you can pray it silently. You can pray it in your heart. But whatever you do, don't miss heaven by 18 inches. Just Pray, Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I'm tired of fighting with this. And right here in the quietness of this moment, I simply just do all that I know how, and that's give you my life. Right here, right now, I give you my life. And I ask you right now, once and for all, 
now and forever, I ask you to save me sitting right here on this pew. And I'll give you my life right now. With heads bowed, nobody looking around, and you say, Brother Jackson, I just prayed that right here, and I really mean it with my heart. Everything I have, I mean it. I want you to raise your hand this morning. I believe God's speaking. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody over here? Just raise your hand up where I can see them. Amen. I see that. I see that. Anybody else? Hands went up over and all around here. Anybody else? Any of you seniors? I know, I know it's a scary thing. I, but sometimes we just got to get honest and say, Lord, here am I. I'm tired of this thing, and I ask you to just take everything about me right now. I give it to you. <laughs> Amen. Anybody else? Just put up your hands. I've seen several hands went up. If that's you, then I'm going to ask you in just a moment boldly to proclaim that. I won't call you by name. won't push you any further. But if you really mean that, want that, desire that, I pray you'll come. I'll take you by the hand and pray with you. We'll rejoice with you this morning. You say, I ain't never met you. I don't, that's okay. Those 3,000 never met Peter when he preached that day. Now, Christian, if you are saved and you know it this morning, let me ask you this question. Do you have the power of God in your life? Right here, right now. If you say, Brother Jason, I need boldness. I need God's power. Then the only way up is down. So I'm going to ask you this morning, if you get on your face before the Lord and just in all contrition and humility, and you decrease and let him increase, you got to get out of the way. you got to get out of the way. And say, God, I ask you to fill me with the Holy Ghost. Fill me this moment. Let me have your power this morning. These altars are open. Don't let him pass you by. Father, I pray this morning, those who said they profess faith in you this, this moment, I pray they'll come and you'll give them the courage to do so only for your glory, Lord. They'd glorify you by making it public this morning. And Father, Christians that are here in this room, that they're sitting there, they're in need of revival. Father, they, they have grown lethargic. They, Lord, you know that They've lost their boldness and their power. I pray, Father, that you would, Lord, re-energize them. Father, help them be, Lord, changed by your Spirit today as they seek your face. And Lord, help us to know that we have not because we ask not. And I pray we will. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. Can't you lead us? You need to come. You come this morning. Ask me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry While on others thou art calling Do not pass me by Savior, Savior broken 
Sing that, Casey, one more time. Let's sing it a cappella, Becky. Let's sing it. We fall sing down. Sing it to the Lord. We lay so our crowns right. at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, 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 holy is the land. All God's people said. Amen. That's where it's at. Brother Lynn, Ducey, would you close this in prayer? I'd appreciate it, my brother. Yeah.